and I'm going to introduce our speaker briefly. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Matt Mountain. Matt is Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University and Director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, responsible for Hubble Science Operations and for the James Webb Space Telescope. And he's also a member of the JWST Science Working Group. Previously, Matt led the team that designed and built the twin Gemini telescopes, and he then served as director of the Gemini Observatory. He told me at dinner that that was his beginning, which I thought was a pretty amazing way to start your career. <laughs> He's done research on star formation, advanced infrared instrumentation, and the capabilities of advanced telescope. He is an author on over 100 research papers, articles, and reports. He earned a BS in physics and a PhD in astrophysics from Imperial College London, he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Astronomical Society, the Royal Astronomical Society, and the International Society for Optical Engineering. His talk tonight is titled, Are We Alone in the Universe? For the first time, we may be able to answer that ancient question. Please hold questions to the end and welcome Matt to the stage. Thank you. I think I have to switch you over. Switch me over. I hope I can. <coughs> Voila. I just did it on my watch here. You on? Oh, I think I'm on. Can you all hear me? Great. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, the previous talk gave actually is a, a good introduction to what I want to talk about tonight. So. We're at an amazing point in our history of science, and we're able to answer, ask some quite profound questions. You know, where have we come from? Can something as complex as life occur elsewhere? Are we, in fact, alone in the universe? I mean, these are all questions we've been asking for millennia. And what I want to point out is that we're at a point where we're going beyond thinking. We're actually on the verge of a second scientific renaissance. The first scientific renaissance was really marked by amazing observations. The first explorers in the 15th century traveling the world realized the world wasn't flat, they didn't fall off the edge. And as it says up here, with all due respect to the renowned Ptolemy, we found everything was the, exactly the opposite of what he said. And as an observer, that's a really good guide. When somebody tells you something is impossible, go check. Perspectives was actually made alive. You could draw what three-dimensional objects looked like. And perhaps the most profound, of course, was Copernicus here, who posited that, of course, the sun, not the earth, was the center of the solar system. But these were all ideas. And of course, the most radical thing that really happened that brought the Renaissance about, of course, was this character here, Galileo, showing the Doge of Venice his new handheld device he had acquired. And with that, when he uniquely pointed it to the sky, this is from his sketchbook, he saw the actual moons going around Jupiter and realized that Copernicus was right. And once he wrote that down, this was an irreversible change because anybody else in the world could take that same handheld device, the first telescope, and make the same observation and come to the same conclusions. And these irreversible changes is what marks the kind of renaissance that we're talking about. So today we're, on, we're at a similar place in our history of science. I'm going to start this talk in a way because the first time I gave a version of this talk, believe it or not, was to the Tenth Circuit Court. They asked me to come and talk about why looking for life in the universe was actually a worthy undertaking, which is something, when you look at the states that represents the tent, was an interesting time. But it, here's the structure that I want to use. I'm going to start with an opening statement. I'm going to say that many of you probably believe this statement. There is strong circumstantial evidence that life should exist outside this earth. There is actually a countervailing view. Despite our Copernican biases, that we don't inhabit any unique place, the emergence of life as a complex system perhaps only happened once. And this is actually 
a completely rational argument. You can read the book, Eerie Science by Paul Davis. And the point about this is, there's actually a big difference between these two. And the factor, if you like, is 10 to the 22. And I'll explain that. That's the uncertainty between these two ideas. That's a very big number. Now, it's smaller than our certainty in our knowledge of dark energy, which is 10 to the 120. So it's 10 orders of magnitude easy, 100 orders of magnitude easier than that problem. But it's still a big problem. This difference is what we're going to discuss tonight between these two opposing views. And I want to show you that we're on the verge of being able to break this paradigm and actually answer this question. And it starts this renaissance with a very famous speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Because the part that I at the end of this famous speech, of course, is what was enabled by the whole space program. A completely unique set of scientific capabilities that we've never in our history had access to before. And as we think forward, what we're able to do with these space capabilities, these space telescopes, these missions to Mars, these new telescopes, that is what is giving us this unique perspective. So let's start with the first tool. Here is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's traveling above your heads at 17,000 miles an hour. It's 300 miles up. It's about the size of a school bus. And its unique position is because it can take super clear pictures because it's above the atmosphere. It's not a very large telescope by telescope standards, but it has unique power because the atmosphere does not blur. And you can see the comparison of these two pictures. On the left, for you, is a picture taken on the Hubble, and on the right is some of the biggest telescopes on the ground. You can see how clear a Hubble image is. And Hubble, you've all seen images like this. These, this is a Hubble picture taken of a star formation. The important thing about this is, this is actually a picture. Right? It's not a computer animation or a creation. What we do with the Hubble Space Telescope is, we take pictures with CCD cameras and infrared cameras, CCD, very much like your modern CCD camera you have today. We take them in a sequence, put filters in, we transmit those images back down to, in fact, the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, put those images together, and this is what you see. And we're very careful to try and create a representation that is real. This is what you would see if you had eyes the size of a Hubble, that's two meters, and you could keep them open for about a day in a vacuum in space, this is what you would see. So they are real pictures. We do other things. We have things called spectrographs, which takes the light and spre spreads them out and looks at their components. We can see individual molecules and atoms, but we can also measure velocities and build three-dimensional pictures of a two-dimensional image. So we can build a three-dimensional picture, and what you're seeing here is flying through a young star formation. This is the true three-dimensional image because we can measure velocity and get distance from that as well. And pictures have power. Here's a picture that was drawn up by William Smith in 1815 of the strata of Great Britain. And it told a very Victorian religious society in Victorian England that the earth had to be measured in millions of years because there was no other way to explain this strata. That was the real, this picture is what said the earth is at least millions of years old. And today, with the Hubble, we can look back billions of years. And this image tells us, because we can also fly through, you're now flying through billions of years of cosmic history because light is fixed speed. The further back you look, the further deeper you look, the further back in time you look, you, you've all flying already, you've gone through six billion years, and you're going back to about 12 billion years in cosmic history in this single image taken with a Hubble Space Telescope. So your perspectives get changed. What do we do with this telescope, and what can we do about this question? So let's start with Exhibit A. This is Exhibit A. This is a picture of all the stars in a galaxy. This happens to be the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor, two and a half million light years away from here. Our 
you, our um, galaxy is too close, but you can count and measure the individual stars in Andromeda with a Hubble Space Telescope. And we know from measurements of other things, that we know today, of course, there are 100 billion stars in any given galaxy. And galaxies are various different types. Here's another galaxy taken with a Hubble Space Telescope. And here's another, 70 million light years away. When the light started being transmitted from this galaxy, it's a bit similar to our own, dinosaurs roamed the Earth here. And they're galaxies of different forms, of different types across the entire universe. But we can actually measure how many galaxies there are. About a decade ago, the, the all directors of the Space Telescope Institute get the privilege of 10% of the time they can do anything they like with. And the second director decided to stare, use the Hubble, to stare at a completely blank piece of sky for 10 days. And the area is, if you take up a drinking straw and look through that little bit of patch of light, that's the area the Hubble looked at for 10 days. And this is what it saw. There are only three individual stars in this image. Every other point here is another galaxy in the area no bigger than a pink drinking straw. People at the time said, don't make that observation. You're going to waste the telescope time. There's nothing there. Well, so when you go look, you discover those people were wrong. You can calculate, therefore, if this is how many was in that single little bit of drinking straw, how many drinking straws do you need to cover the whole sky? And the answer is 200 billion galaxies. You know how many stars are roughly in each galaxy? Do the math. And you can actually calculate there are two, and I'm not going to count the zeros, but I'll tell you there's two to the 22 stars in the observable universe. And so that is exhibit A, and that's where that two to the 22 comes from. We know today there are two to the 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. And so many questions are, therefore, there has to be life. Or no, there is only one place. That is where that 10 to the 22 difference in opinion comes from. So we know how many stars there are. How many have planets? Where do planets come from? Well, we know a lot about our own planets. Here's Mars. We can see it. You can see the ice caps. This is a Hubble image taking over time. You can watch the weather on the various planets. You can see things that you can't see from the ground. This is an ultraviolet image of the top of Jupiter. What are you seeing in this ultraviolet light? Well, actually what you're seeing is the aurora borealis on Jupiter. On the green one you're seeing here is our aurora borealis. It's the magnetic fields from Jupiter streaming electrons and protons from the sun, exciting it. So you can see aurora borealis in ultraviolet radiation. That's something the Hubble can see. And what the Hubble was able to see using the same technique in the ultraviolet was the very first time evidence of plumes of water perhaps coming through the cracks in Europa which may be the first opportunity to get access to the seas in Europa, which you heard about in your last lecture. We can fly a spacecraft through there. Maybe we can sample that water and see what's there. We can look further out in our own solar system. Here's Pluto, and we found all these moons. We're about four light hours out now of our solar system. And we all know Pluto is no longer a planet, right? This is the image that did that. This is the Hubble image. This is Hubble's fault. This is an image of the 10th planet. We're able to measure its size, and we're able to measure its mass because it has a moon. And in fact, there's a whole class of other objects out there, Kuiper Belt objects out there, further out, 13 light years out. But that's just a local solar system. What about other places? Well, we can look at the famous Orion Nebulae. So this is Orion, which you see from the ground. And with the Hubble, you can actually peer into that star formation region. It's a nursery of stars where young stars are being born. And you can create this three-dimensional fly-through, which is as real as we can imagine it, because we're able to measure distances. And we made this for an IMAX movie. And we're now flying into the heart of Orion. There are bright, powerful stars in there, which are blowing out this bubble in the gas making out new cavities, compressing gas. And as you fly in, you can see these violent winds there and the shocks and so forth. These big new stars were formed in this stellar nursery. And in the outskirts, you begin to see shadows. Those little shadows, what are they? They're little solar systems in formation. This one is not great because you're going to get destroyed. But at the edge of Orion, we find these proprolids like this one, and this is an animation at the very end here. 
you can see disks forming. Wherever you see a disk, you have a planetary system. And we can look at other parts. Here's another region. Optical radiation is burning out this pillar here. It's about two light years across, burning it out. And we can move to the infrared, and you see this jet. What this jet tells you, there's a spinning system with the disk, because the only way to get rid of the angular momentum is along the axis. That disk becomes a planetary system. So we know there's a planetary system being formed here, and we can see them across the entire galaxy. Some of these early systems we can actually look at with the Hubble, and 400 years of after Galileo saw the moons going around Jupiter, we were able to identify another solar system. This is a Jupiter-sized planet going around another star, the first image of another solar system in a very young star, much younger than ours. So that is the first evidence of planets. And what we now know is that every time stars form, they form disks and planetary systems. So that's exhibit B. Planetary systems are just a byproduct of making stars. They are the debris left over. So how many planets are there? This is what has really changed. If I gave this talk a decade ago, I would say, I don't know, or a few. 2006, Hubble looked at this region of the sky of 180,000 stars. And that transit you heard about, the transit of Venus, if a Jupiter goes in front of one of these stars, as you can see this animation, the light changes by less than 1%. And so they watched this region for over a week. And they found 17 stars, the light dipped. You think, that's not very many. You do the math, and you go, oh, there are 5 billion Jupiters in our galaxy. Then the Kepler spacecraft was launched, and its first result said there were 20 million five years ago. Last year, the final results came in, and today, from a Kepler, we know there are 100 billion planetary systems in our galaxy. You didn't know that five years ago. I didn't know that five years ago. When you go out to the night sky, and you look up, every other star you see has a planetary system around it. That's new. And this is what Kepler, the Kepler spacecraft NASA did. This is the census of all the, gal all the planets it found. That green part is where there are small planets here. So this is the temperature here. That green part is where liquid water might live. And we're looking for planets the size of the Earth, not these big fat things like Jupiter, the Hubble can see, or Neptunes. You can see there are a few in there. And what we now know, in that Goldilocks zone, 10 to 20% of all stars have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. We now know that, statistically. We've done the census. Now, those last two words are very important, and I'll come back to it. We know what the statistics are. So there's Exhibit C. Planetary systems can be found around almost every star, and between 10 to 20% of all stars have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. That is something we didn't know five years ago. We also know, well, what about what's on those planets? What's it made of? Well, we know what happens when stars come to the end of their life. This is a planetary nebulae. This is a star roughly the size of the sun that's burnt up all its hydrogen and is beginning to throw off its outer shell that begins to burn helium and heavier elements. And you get these incredible patterns. You can see these shells going out. Here's another planetary nebulae, another star roughly the size of the Earth at the end of its life, some four billion years from now. Here's what happens to an Earth, a, a, sun, a, a star the size of our sun. This is what our sun will look like in four and a half billion years' time. It will run out of hydrogen. It will burn up the outer layers. And in case you're wondering what happens to us, this is two light years across, so Alpha Centauri is just here. So the scale is somewhat in the middle. We're gone. However, our life has not been in vain because that star has made stuff. It's made a bunch of metals in the inner furnace and actually made all the elements up to iron. When you have larger stars than the sun, about eight times larger than the sun, something a little bit more violent happened. This is an animation, of course. You get a supernova. You can't stop the collapse just from nuclear burning 
the, the place literally annihilates itself, and you're actually looking at the inverse of what you learned at school, E equals mc squared. You're seeing mass being turned into energy. In that process, you create new elements. And they're incredibly explosive. Here is what we see today. This was a supernova remnant that we see today. It, was, it exploded in 1057, and it was seen by the Chinese and the Native Americans here because it was so bright. Here is another, the Crab Nebula, correct. Here is another remnant. This is done in three dimensions. It's all that is left. It, nothing is left, it looks like, in the middle. There is no star in the middle of this. It's completely been destroyed in the supernova. But in the middle of this, there's incredibly hot gas because if you use an X-ray telescope, you can see it. X-ray emission to millions, almost 10 million degrees centigrade, the gas is being heated. And we can look at some of these remnants with the Hubble using an ultraviolet spectrograph and actually pass the light through the equivalent of a prism. And you can see these elements being formed in that explosion. So what we know in the vitamins we all take, you came, we all came from stars. At the beginning of the universe, it was only hydrogen and helium. Everything else came either from inside the star or from a supernova explosion depending on however they are. So these elements are created when stars die. And we actually know this happens across vast distances. Here's a picture of M83, Messier 83. It's 15 million light years from here. And you blow up that region, you can actually see Orions in another galaxy. You can see stars forming and dying in that whole process. You can look even further back. Here are supernova going off in galaxies that are five to six billion light years from here, i.e. five to six billion years in the past. So these processes are going on. And we can actually use the Hubble Space Telescope to measure where are these elements across time. So here is a bright source called a quasar, and it shines across history. We're shining almost across 10 billion years of history using, the, using as a flashlight, and the light gets intercepted by various elements through the ages, and we can see the elements being built up over cosmic history. You see more and more lines as they form here, more and more metals build up over time. We can see that happening with the Hubble Space Telescope. The carbon, the silicon, the oxygen gets more and more abundant across cosmic time as more and more stars die and reprocess the material. So here's our Exhibit D. Over the course of cosmic history, the cycle of birth and death of stars builds elements for life throughout the entire universe. It's everywhere. You can see it. It's not a hypothesis. It's not a guess. You can measure it, and you can see it. What can we see in the atmosphere of these exoplanets now? It turns out, using this transit method, just like Venus, you can actually pass, as you go in part, you can just measure that little bit of extra light that goes through the atmosphere and you can actually see what might be in the atmosphere. And it was the Hubble Space Telescope that pioneered this tech. We did not know the Hubble was so stable that as the little bit of light, less than 1%, and then one-tenth of 1% difference of that light allowed us to measure what's in the atmosphere, the little ring of, of gas that surrounds the planet, we began to see stuff. What should you see? This is what our Earth would look like if you looked at its atmosphere. This is actually an image, of course, of Voyager looking back at the Earth. And this is the light of the Earth reflected off the Moon, because it's actually quite hard to measure the Earth if you're on the Earth. And these wiggles all mean something. It's the light spread up across its spectrum and the optical to the infrared, and everything here means something. It's this combination of all these things which tells us we're looking at a living planet. Any one element, whether it be oxygen, or carbon dioxide, or methane, by themselves can be created just from chemistry. Put the gas in the bottle and shake. What you can't do is have oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, all in the same bottle if you shake it up. You have to have non-equilibrium processes. This is what a living planet looks like. Even more importantly, you see these jumps called the vegetation jump. That is photosynthesis, the physical size of cells harvesting red light for photosynthesis. The light resonating in the cavities of those cells creates that bump. Put all that together, this is what a living planet looks like. 
If you see that, you're seeing a, li a life. So what can we do today? It turns out we can't do quite as well as this. But that technique that I just described actually works. We looked at a Jupiter 60 light years from here, around another planet, and we found methane. Last week, doing a very detailed, very deep study, the deepest study Hubble has ever taken with our colleagues on the infrared telescope, we stared for almost a week at a single planet. We found water vapor in the atmosphere of a Neptune-sized planet. And you can see, it's not a really clear detection. You know, for an astronomer or an astrophysicist, it's obvious. To anybody else, you say, really? But statistically, it is significant. We have shown that you can detect liquid water in the atmosphere. And in fact, we also know there are no clouds here, because we can tell that. You're looking at clear skies on a Neptune some 30 light years from here. So that's what we can do with the Hubble. But of course, we want to go further. We want to find what Earth's like. We, this is what we can see. We've just managed to get to Neptunes of the Hubble. It's taken an enormous amount of time. We want to go deeper and further. We want to go down to the Earth-like planets. We're going to need a bigger telescope. Fortunately, we're building a bigger telescope. James Webb before. I want to show the role of the James Webb. It was originally designed to look at the very edge of the universe, look at the dark ages. But we now know, because it's an infrared telescope, and it's a vast telescope, with very advanced mirrors, very lightweight mirrors made of beryllium, not glass, that operate at incredibly low temperatures, 40 Kelvin, or roughly minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Each mirror is so flat, if you stretch it across the US, the largest bump is three inches. And we have this huge um, tennis court size sun shield to keep it that cold. And it's so big we have to use NASA's biggest test chamber to test it in. After all, we don't want another Hubble error. So this is the test chamber that was designed to test the Apollo program. Today, our science missions are so big they fill the same facilities as was originally designed for the Apollo program. And this is an infrared telescope. It's specifically designed to look at infrared wavelengths because we were supposed to look, we're look, it's designed to look at the very edge of the known universe. But it turns out, and the infrared here allows you to see through dust, it also allows you to see where stars are formed and where planets might be formed. More importantly, if you're trying to find a planet in this Goldilocks zone, if it's too close, it's too hot. If it's too cold, it's too icy. That just right place it turns out the infrared is a really good place to look. Here are three spectra of three planets at different parts in our own solar system. You can guess there's carbon dioxide, ozone, and water. You can guess probably what these are. We have Venus, we have Mars, and that's the Earth. You can see how different their spectra are. And as we let these planets transit, the James Webb will have the power to look at almost Earth-like planets and actually detect for the first time liquid water on the surface of these planets. So in 2018, we hope to be able to find for the first time water worlds. Water is the first step to looking for life. So let's recap. There's a very famous equation that many of you know probably called the Drake Equation. It was written by Frank Drake, who was a radio astronomer. He tried to characterize how many civilizations there might be. Believe it or not, this equation has come back today with a new legitimacy. Now, it's not quite the same equation. We don't know how long civilizations live. We don't know if they're civilizations. What we're interested in for the first step is, is there life? And so a group are now beginning to use this term, the observer's Drake equation. What can we actually observe? And here it is where n is the number of life-bearing planets at time t, where time t is today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. 
And each one of these terms means something. So here's the equation. The number of stars that, that are born, that die, and actually are formed in different parts of the galaxy. What's the probability they have planetary systems? How many metals are formed? How many have terrestrial planets? Do they have liquid water? Are they in the habitable zone where water can actually be liquid? And what's the probability of life? So in the next 60 seconds, I'm going to give you a complete astrophysics lecture that summarizes what I've just said. Because it turns out today, each one of these terms is now observable. We're beginning to understand how stars form across our galaxy and in other galaxies. We understand how stars die right across time, right back to almost the beginning of the universe. We begin to understand how metals formed and disks formed, and that becomes an observable. We now know because of Kepler and other experiments how many Earth-like planets there are. And in 2018, we should actually be able to measure whether any of them have water. We now know all of these terms. We've never been in that position before, ever. First time in human history, we only have one term left, the probability of life. So what does that tell us? Well, we know extremophiles exist. We heard about that earlier on today from your last lecture. Life is found in incredible limits, in radiation, pools, in battery acid caves, deep water everywhere. Obviously, life must be everywhere. Well, at least on the early Earth, we know life formed 3.6 billion years ago, and it was a pretty violent place. So it's a pretty tenacious thing. However, that's an observation of one system, our system. We are fortunate because we are here because it will happen. If it didn't happen, we wouldn't be here to see it. If you think about that for a minute, it's a contradiction. There's nothing unique, or it is completely unique. And that's the problem here. We still haven't solved this problem. Now, astrophysics has knocked a few orders of magnitude off this. We know 10% of all the stars have Earth-like planets. As I'll tell you in a minute, only 10% of the stars in a galaxy have planets that are any use to us. We'll come back to that. And probably only 10% of galaxies are actually useful. But the big number is still an uncertainty. And if you ask a biologist or a chemist what happens, here is a quote. We cannot calculate the odds of the spontaneous emergence of cellular life on a plausible probiotic Earth in any satisfying or convincing way. So as an experimentalist, let's do the observation. What do we have to do to do the observation? What do we look for? Here is an animation of Kepler-62. It appears to be very much like an Earth going around a star similar to our sun, and if it's in the habitable zone, we would want to know whether or not it had a spectrum like this, right? The problem is, Earths are incredibly faint. In fact, they're one part in 10 to the 10 fainter than our sun. And that Kepler object is almost 1,000 light years away. It's impossible for us. What Kepler did was a census. It looked out across this very narrow area and looked at all the stars in a very, very narrow cone. It did a census of the city, but it didn't tell you what was in any one neighborhood. What we need to do is look much more locally to anything we can actually detect. It turns out NASA is going to be launching such a satellite. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Telescope, a very original name. It's going to look at all the nearby stars now using the Kepler method because it worked so well and actually allow us to look locally within the 200 light years of here for every single star that might have a planet going around it. It'll just tell us if it's there or not. It's the same transit method. And that will give us candidates that JWST can use to, to work out what the probability of water is. Because water is what we need to find to actually define what a habitable zone is. Because right now, though, you can't even know what a habitable zone is because it could have clouds. There's a huge argument. The way to determine what it is, is, is the liquid water. The other point is, so how do we make that last measurement? How do we take that next step, the final measurement? What is the probability of life? It turns out our own galaxy has a habitable zone. 
If you're near the center of the galaxy, there are too many supernova and young stars blowing up, sterilizing everything. If you're too far out in the galaxy, the stars are actually too old. They're second or third generation stars. They haven't built up enough elements to form even dust that can make planetary systems. You've got to be in the middle part of the galaxy, which, of course, turns out we are. What a surprise. So if we look at our noble neighborhood, it's probably typical if life is abundant everywhere. Galaxy is a very big place, but all we can look at is locally because that's where we are. It happens to be where life emerged. Now we know where all the stars are today. So here is a three-dimensional picture of all the stars within 200 light years of the Earth. We're in the center of the sun. Here are all the actual stars. Those with potentially habitable planets, they're the ones that last up to 10 billion years. We know that 10 to 20 percent have it, so we can do the math. Here's what a five-meter telescope will do. In a computer, we put an Earth around every single one and ask, how many stars can we see? Very few. With a 10-meter telescope, we can look deeper and separate out further and go even deeper into the cloud. We begin to see tens of stars that might have Earth-like planets. With a 20-meter space telescope, we go even deeper into a local cloud. We can separate even further. We can actually see hundreds of planets, Earth-like planets, around our solar neighborhood but you need a 20-meter telescope because of where the stars are. The stars are actually fixed in the sky. This is what you can do. We now know, of course, we've built HST and we're building the James Webb Space Telescope and that will actually deal with most of those terms in that Drake equation. Unfortunately, what we've discovered, unless we're feeling really lucky, that famous Clint Eastwood saying, how lucky are we feeling, the James Webb might find something if life is really abundant and we're very lucky, perhaps it will find something. Statistically, you're going to need more objects because what's the orientation and everything else. We're going to have to get into the regime of telescopes of this scale if we're ever going to answer the probability of life. If you think about this for a moment, you think, oh my goodness, this is hard. It turns out on the ground, we build telescopes of this scale all the time. What lessons are there to be learned there? The amazing thing is, if you have a telescope this size, you can do something else. The epoxy spacecraft went to look at comets, decided to look back at the Earth, and this is a, a movie of the Earth as you can see it, and the Earth, of course, rotates, and you see different colors coming in like this as it goes around. You can see the moon going past there. Collapse that light into a single point, and ask, what can I learn just by watching how each color changes with time? of a planet like this? Can I reconstruct what's on that planet just by watching the change as the planet rotates? And this is what the epoxy did of the Earth. There's the real Earth underneath, and this is what epoxy calculated. That's not a bad approximation of land and ocean. So just by watching an exoplanet and how it changed the time, we can actually do remote sensing of another Earth-like planet 10 to 100 light years from here. We could see if it had oceans or continents. Now, this is non-trivial undertaking, but there have been other non-trivial undertakings in the history of mankind. Here's the Parthenon. It's a vast structure. It was rebuilt in 126 AD. The central hole there is nine meters across. There's the Hubble and James Webb. You know, it's not such a uh, uh, difficult undertaking compared to what other people have done 2,000 years ago. But there's also a very important point. Now, any exciting field needs an ambitious goal. But as Martin Harwood likes to remind us, the freedom to pursue esoteric science is contingent on a social contract. That we should help with the technology we have in practical ways as well. What is that partnership? The Hubble Space Telescope was a partnership between technologies people needed to look down and the shuttle program. This is what we have to remember. This is how astronomy started. The Dodge of Venice, looking through a telescope, I don't think is particularly interested in what's happening in the sky. He cares a lot of what's happening across the horizon, which is why he funded the telescope. 
And the James Webb Space Telescope is actually leading the way of how to increase the collecting area of telescopes. That technology is unique and powerful technologies, making these incredibly lightweight telescopes, which are in fact scalable. You can add more and more of these hexagons together, which we do on the ground. We're now building 20 and 30 meter telescopes on the ground using these kind of approaches. Now, you don't want to launch those telescopes because they're a little heavy, but the lightweight technology that we need can be used for other things. And technology is everything. Because here is a graph of the Hubble Infrared Telescope Tester and James Webb in terms of its launch mass per collecting area. That means as you go further down, you get more collecting area by unit mass. What costs money in space is how much does it weigh to get launched. So the cost goes down. The amazing thing was if we had the James Webb technologies today, the Hubble would have cost eight times less than it actually did back in the 70s and 80s. Technology changes the cost curve. And there's no point trying to design a huge telescope. It's going to cost, be unaffordable. You've got to use technology to drive the cost down. And those technologies are something that you uniquely have in this country, in the US, and for other reasons. It's not just us who care about big telescopes. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. But what you don't know, this is the advert that sits on the metro station outside the Pentagon. Why did Northrop Grumman put up this advert outside the Pentagon, because it's telling the Pentagon, we have some technologies you might be interested in. DARPA is funding a study about how to build lightweight 20 meter telescopes, not to look in space, but to look down. And you don't need a security clearance to know that if I want to be 36 miles, miles away, which rotates the same rate of the Earth, I know what big telescope I need if I actually want to be able to watch somebody get out of their car and walk away. There is a a partnership there in technology that astronomy has always had and had for 400 years. The Hubble Space Telescope was the sixth or seventh telescope of its kind. The astronomers eventually got to turn around and look out. NASA is also investing in brand new rockets to go to Mars. We can say, ah, excuse me, if you're looking for a ride, we actually know what you can put in that big rocket too. And as John Grunsfeld, the associate administrator for NASA says, New science is enabled with these brand new launch technologies. It's not just about getting humans into space. It's by getting great <coughs> missions into space. So we know that James Webb can look at liquid water. But if you want to look at biosignatures, or the discovery of life, signatures that tell you life might exist, and then actually work out if life is there, we're going to need larger launch vehicles. But that will enable an amazing class of new science. We're actually entering an amazing period where we can do things we couldn't have done before because NASA is investing in other areas. We can big, big telescopes that actually could detect biosignatures and Earth-like planets within 200 light years from here. We can send missions to Europa in three to four years and fly through those plumes and see if there is actually life beneath that ice because it's broken through the ice barrier. So imagine the moment. We bring together all these ideas, the science, the technologies, which is uniquely available to our generation for the first time in human history. Imagine the moment the announcement is weighed, we found another living Earth, an Earth 2.0. What does that mean? Imagine the middle schooler procrastinating about his math homework, my son, a few years ago. And they hear that news and realize, hold on a minute, I could be the engineer that builds a new rocket engine that lets me go to that system that we've just found. Imagine the biology teacher trying to motivate a high school biology class and she wakes up and realizes, I can walk into my class today and say, we as a species for the very first time have got to the point when we can look at another planet around the star and we can see that evolution and life has occurred elsewhere. Imagine how that perspective changes the way you think about biology and life. Imagine the moment the whole world wakes up to the news that our loneliness is over. That because of the technologies and the science, the world's been transformed in an irreversible way. We now realize we're not alone. 
And you can't step back from that discovery. The world has changed forever. And those moments happen rarely, but they are close to us. Because of where we are in our history in science and technology. But even more importantly, I thought, I'd finish with some words from Sir Carl Sagan, who thought about this even more deeply. What new images are you dreamt of in our time? And we have what in another generation? And another. How far will our nomadic species have wandered by the end of the next century? safely arrayed on many worlds through the solar system and beyond will be unified by their common heritage by their regard for their home planet and by the knowledge that whatever other life may be the only humans in all the universe come from Earth they will gaze up and strain to find the blue dot in their skies they will marvel at how vulnerable the repository of all our potential once was. How perilous our infancy. How humble our beginnings. How many rivers we had to cross before we found our way. And the remarkable thing was, if you look at this picture, this is a picture of our Earth taken by John Grunsfeld on the last flight of, the, of um, the Hubble. But to cross that next river, to find an Earth 2.2, to answer the question, are we alone, is actually for the first time in human history within our grasp. It's an amazing time to be alive and to be a scientist. And thank you for listening. So we have time for some questions, and the procedure is that there are a couple of people with microphones. When you raise your hand, they'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, when you have the microphone, please stand up. Please tell us your name. Please tell us whether you're just visiting or you're a member of PSW, and ask your question. So let's see hands for questions. We have a question right in the back there. Do I do the picking or you do the picking, I hope? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name's Isaac Schomer. I'm uh, visiting, and uh, my question is that you said that uh, elements of a heavier atomic number than uh, iron all come from supernovas. So in that case, how do they all get to Earth? Good question. So if you think about what happens, these supernova blow up into the interstellar medium, all right? And these clouds... <laughs> Does that mean? These clouds of gas basically over time recoalesce in gravity and instabilities and they form a completely new generation of stars. So in that picture of the galaxy I showed you, M83, you can see stars being created, the supernova clouds going out, driving into the interstellar medium, powering into the other gas, actually re-condensing um, and forming another generation of stars. And this cycle is continuous over hundreds of of millions, in fact, billions of years. And over time, you build up, so you get three or four generations of stars. We are a third or fourth generation star, our sun. And it took three, of those genera three or four generations to get enough material, the heavier elements, that you can form dust and disk and all the elements we see now. It's a violent place, the universe. It's a little bit slow. Hi, I'm, I'm Bob Terry, a member of the Society and Years and my dues, but uh, I'm here. Uh, the question is, if we look now from 20 meter telescopes to something somewhat larger, and then think toward going from biosignatures to biosignals, what is the order of magnitude in technology you need to make that transition between biosignatures and particular observations that, that, that access SETI data? 
on that star? So it's always a very good question. And so first of all, it turns out because you get these rotations, we can already find, probably see the outlines of continents and oceans in the way I showed you. Well, people are, there's two answers to this. A friend of mine, John Grasfeld, will say, well, if we see um, fluorocarbons in the atmosphere, just in the spectra, we know there's a civilization that may not be too intelligent. Um, but if you actually want to resolve, you know, actually see, make a picture of this, you need telescopes that are kilometers across. <coughs> so you're not going to do it in a single dish. I mean, ultimately, you know, if you find such a set of planets, or one or two, Maybe you're motivated to try and find a way to actually build the pictures that you might see. But you're going to have to build arrays of telescopes in space that are kilometers across that allows you to build up this picture. That's, that's not outrageous. It, well, well, I mean, I could ask Jeremy here, how outrageous might it be trying to fly 10 James Webb Space Telescopes? Which is what you would have to do. You've got to find a better way to do it, but that's, you know... I'm yeah, not. I mean, it, that, you know, that's the most amazing thing. Many of these technologies didn't exist two or three decades ago. Today they exist, so you can actually have a sensible discussion. The real issue is what engineering do you have to do to make it affordable? Um, my question concerns, oh, my name's Timothy Thomas. I'm a member of the society. Uh, concerns the traditional approach to SETI is to listen for them. Right. And uh, you didn't mention that. No. Nope. And I'm aware that it, probably ha hasn't succeeded yet in detecting uh, extraterrestrial radio-based civilizations. I'd like to know your opinion as to why that's failed and whether we ought to invest more in it. Okay, so I'm an experimental scientist, astrophysicist, so I like to observe. So you ask the question, SETI's looking at radio waves, so the civilization you're looking for has got to have radio technology. How long have we had radio technology? Hundreds of years, maybe a hundred years. We're not going to have it much longer. We're going to go to cable and everything else, right? So there's this window. The other problem is all the stars nearby are differ by us in age by hundreds of millions of years. In some cases, billions of years. What's the probability that their civilization and our civilization match up in time where they're both using radio and the transmit time as they go? I mean, I just don't know the answer to that. You know, and so. It's an observation. Carry on observing. If you find something, we found it. Here, what I'm saying is, let's step back a minute and just see if we, let's try and find some candidates that might have life, of this, you know, as it's expressed in the atmosphere of these planets. That's something I actually can, I can calculate now today how difficult that is. I can't tell you yet how difficult SETI is. Hi, Rudy. Quick question. Yes. You talked about the, uh, John Kennedy's um, goal. We, uh, uh, during that period, in the early 70s, the GDP, the gross domestic product, increased substantially. Correct. I once asked <coughs> Werner von Braun how much of that was due to the space program. And he, off the top of his head, say about a third of it. Was he close? All, all I remember is that at the time it was rough. I mean, today NASA is 0.4% of GDP, 0.4% of the federal budget. It was roughly 4% during the Apollo program, at least for a few years. So that's the level. Remote spacecraft are significantly cheaper than sending humans. We don't know yet how to send humans across hundreds of light years. We do know how to build telescopes that can detect radiation that go across billions of light years. So it's a different, but I mean, the, the Apollo era was amazing national commitment to build an entire space infrastructure. <coughs> and we, as scientists, have benefited enormously from that infrastructure today because it's made things possible, like the Hubble, the Mars rovers, and the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's those revolutionary telescopes that have put us in this point where we can now, I can say to you seriously, I know how many Earth-like planets there are. And I know how I could go out and detect them. If you hadn't made that, if the U.S. had not made that investment to go to the moon and make those technologies, I would still be saying, this is what we might want to do. Now we can do it. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I know David does, but could some of the other people who have questions raise your hand? That last uh, <laughs> advertisement you showed with the music didn't, didn't mention the search for life, what it 
claimed was were the only human life and we and uh, all this research and all this struggle is to start colonies on other planets. Is that a That's reasonable? That's not what he said. What he said was, it'd be, you know, ultimately we do actually have to find <laughs> another home. Our star will go in four billion years time. But he says, well, what other life might be out there, there is at least the human beings know where they came from. So it was an appeal to just think, ab look above ourselves and say, you know, ultimately, we are going to have to get out of our solar system, and we can take some initial steps. It made no comment about what you do if you find other life or anything like this, but pointing out that it is something in our spirit to actually explore. And that exploration has been worthwhile for millennia, and maybe it's time to think about exploring again. Because for the first time, we might actually find an Earth 2.0. We don't know if it'll have life on it. We'll have to find that out too. My name is Preston Thomas. I'm a member of the Society. You made um, a comment about that magic moment when we can finally declare definitively that we found another Earth. Um, the a living Earth, Earth, actually, in my uh, case. Pardon? A living Earth, in a my case. A living Earth, yes. Um, the, is it too early to begin discussions of what the criteria for such a discussion would be? Has that been kicked around? The, where, 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 where is it? The, the, Library of Congress, in fact, held a workshop what, two or three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, on that very subject. What would the societal impact be on the discovery of extraterrestrial life on another planet? I wasn't at that conference. I was traveling at the time. So apparently the proceedings are coming up. So that's a legitimate topic of discussion. What would the effect be of the realization that there's other living systems out there? You know, we have never, as a species, really confronted this. We think we have, but all those places have been reachable. Uh, we have a question up here in the front. Can we... Anyone else have a question? Uh, Raise your thank hand. You. Dave Rubenwitz, I am a member. Uh, you mentioned that the Earth is, a third or four, is uh, uh, around a third or fourth generation star. Yeah. Uh, do you know, is, would life as we know it be possible before third or fourth generation? How old are the oldest third or fourth generation stars? Uh, could, it, could we be the first planet to develop life just because of the evolution of the universe? Good question. So let me answer it two ways. First of all, if you look at all the nearby stars to us, we can actually age them. We can actually measure. We know how to measure ages of stars quite well. And it turns out that some of the stars nearby us are actually older than us by roughly 100 to 500 million years. Now, that's actually quite significant. 500 million years ago on this Earth, there was no oxygen in our atmosphere, right? So that we know. The second thing we know, because we've seen star formation work, that's why I showed those pictures of Orion, the simulations, we know that to form planets, the first thing you ought to have is dust. To have dust, you could have things like silicon and carbon. You're going to have enough of it that it actually coagulates and makes planets. And we can't see yet, because the, older, the very older systems are at the very edges of our own galaxy, or in other galaxies. We haven't seen evidence yet, you know, and this is one thing the James Webb Telescope will do. We'll be trying to look at, do we see dusty systems in much older stars that aren't second or third generation? Theoretically, we're beginning to believe you need a certain level of elements for this coagulation tape. Also, the stars themselves, for stars to actually live 10 billion years, they have to have a certain amount of what we call metals, that is everything heavier than hydrogen and, and helium in them. Because if they don't, they burn out too quickly. And we already know that, at least for us, in our one case, four and a five, it took four and a half billion years for me to stand here. So you've got to have long-lived stars, which also got our disks and you've got our stars. So it seems likely, observationally, that you have to have third or fourth generation stars to make this happen. But we're still learning a bit more about what these disks mean, and we haven't found old systems yet. We know what happens in very young systems. They get blown apart. In the central part of Orion, those disks, those big, bright, hot stars are just blasting it to pieces. So that's not a great place. What we don't know is in the outer parts of the galaxy, because they're very far away, what we can see. Any further questions? 
Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, that last term, probability of life, what are some of the indications that we've got that when we see it? That's also a good question. And in some sense, again, it's an obs you know, as I, I was trying to make, if you, many physicists and astrophysicists say, well, of course, life form, because we're astrophysicists, we're untroubled by self-doubt. Um, <laughs> if you ask the evolutionary biologists on the other hand, they say, did you realize how many things have actually got to happen for this to happen? I wonder, so you saw that quote from the professor at Harvard. The, the point about looking, it, what it does, five, 10 years ago, people felt if you just detected oxygen, that was sufficient. Others felt if you could detect ozone, that was sufficient. What we have learned today is that many geothermal processes create those elements. If you just have rock and water, you can create oxygen in the atmosphere. That's not life. What the current consensus is that really what you have to do, you need that whole spectrum, which is why this is actually a hard problem and you need to have a big telescope. You've got to be able to see things like methane and oxygen and water and ozone. Because if you actually put those gases in the bottle and shook it up, they would react and you wouldn't see them anymore. So there are things generating, non-equilibrium processes generating those things that allow it all to happen. Now we know on Earth what those things are. You know, and there's some hint that there's some methane in Mars and so forth, but we know, but there are, you know, the Occam's razor, the simplest explanation, can geothermal processes or chemistry do that? You know, you see methane on the outer atmosphere of Jupiter's, as I showed you. There's no sense that's from life. That is just photochemistry, the sun reacting. But when you see all of those elements together and liquid water, we know that the complex chemical reactions that formed ultimately from amino acids to DNA those have to be mediated by liquid water. Water is a remarkable substance, it turns out, in the biology, and I'm not a biologist, but you know, I read the papers. Without liquid water, it seems impossible, just because of the chemistry. So you've got to have liquid water, and you've got to have all these other things. When you have all those together, the simplest explanation becomes there may well be a living system. So that's the way you answer it. Of course, you don't ever absolutely know until you go there. But that's the first indication if you can't recreate this with chemistry, which is why you have to have earth scientists and planetary scientists and astrophysicists all working together, because they say, oh, guys, well, if I tweak the computer program, I can make this. You go, oh, that, okay, all right, that's a simpler explanation. Right now, we don't know how to create on the computer or any way we know all of those elements together in our atmosphere. So that tells us that something is generating those things and living systems turns out to be the simplest explanation. Last question. Hi, uh, Chuck Devine. Sometimes I'm a member of the society when people pay me enough so that I can pay my dues. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's been a question that's been knocked around in a variety of places. It's called the Fermi paradox. Where are they? I mean, like, we've gone in a few decades from having uh, a small little thing go into the sky called Sputnik to actually humans walking on the moon. And now people, uh, even before these things happen, people are starting to say, gee, we've gone this far in only a few centuries. Why haven't somebody or some creatures from other planets come here? Because we can think of that. Right. So there are two answers to that Fermi paradox, and it's called the big filter. And it depends which side of this filter you are on. The first answer is, we are unique. We are the only life in the universe. I mean, that is one answer to the Fermi paradox. It's completely consistent with that answer. The second answer isn't such a great answer. Is that the reason we haven't come across all the civilizations or they haven't come across us is that advanced civilizations burn out over a certain period. So civilization rises up, goes on for a certain length. And if our civilization doesn't overlap with their civilization with the transit time in between, it doesn't work. So I always say that if we find life is really abundant in the solar system, that's really bad news. Because that means probably life is abundant everywhere and nobody's visited us, therefore civilizations don't last very long. I prefer to find no life on Mars, no life on Europa, that would actually imply that maybe life is fairly rare and we're going to get to live for a long time, if you have a Copernican view of the world. The alternative is, we're alone. And so those, and there's no way to differentiate between those two until we make the observations. 
That's the point. But the Fourier paradox is answered by the big filter. And we as a species should care which side of that filter we're in. If you think life is very abundant, or maybe we've survived long enough, and we'll do the discovery of other civilizations. So, it, you know, it's an interesting question, and it was posed. So it's not, it's not obvious that finding life on Mars is a good thing. Matt, thank you so much for your talk. Before you go... Thank you. of your talk uh, signed by the members of the general committee. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you.